The guy who like, wah, throws himself past your guard and, you know, in the process he catches your arm, rips that shoulder, undoes all that good work, and now you're back to square one. Welcome to Grapple Arts Radio. Hi everybody, Stefan Kesting from GrappleArts.com and, I have to point out, the author of a roadmap for BJJ. So, <laughs> those are my criteria. I'm a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, combat submission wrestling instructor, longtime martial artist, and what we're doing today is we're doing a Q&A podcast for the podcast listeners and a Q&A video for the people consuming this information on YouTube or on Facebook or wherever they're, they're viewing it. So, first order of business, a roadmap for BJJ. So, I recently took my book, A Roadmap for BJJ, and put it on Amazon as an Amazon Kindle book. And I'm really excited because it did really well. Tons and tons of downloads. So this book basically breaks down my approach to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's a positional based approach. Jiu Jitsu looks like a giant jumble of arms and legs and grips and people watching it, especially early in the game, have no idea what's going on. But once you realize that it's really mostly only a few positions, say, six depending how you count it that would be guard mount knee mount side mount turtle and back mount and once you have a couple of ways to go between those positions and to have something to do from each one of those positions brazilian jiu-jitsu becomes a lot a lot simpler it's kind of like doing an 80 20 analysis of something what's the 20 percent of work that gets you 80 percent of the results that's this book so if that sounds good to you Go to Amazon.com, download as a Kindle book if you've got a Kindle. If you don't have a Kindle, you probably have a smartphone or tablet. You can download the Kindle app. It's free. And that pretty much opens up the entire world of digital books to you. So I know I'm always traveling with, uh, with my iPhone and my iPad. And I hate being without a book. But books are big. Books are heavy. You always have your phone in your pocket. So I, you know, waiting in line. I'm usually reading a book on my, my iPhone. I'm usually reading a book on my tablet. So I, if you don't have the Kindle app, man, you got to get it. Not just for my book. Of course, my book should be the very first one you download. But there are tons of books out there. And uh, it, helps, it helps make downtime productive time. So a roadmap for BJJ. The next thing we're going to talk about is return from injury. So a reader recently wrote me. Actually, this wasn't recent. This was a while ago. And I apologize for not getting back to him earlier. I get so many emails, tweets, messages, uh, sometimes even phone calls, and it's just completely impossible to answer each one of them. I do my best. I try. I'm going out of my mind. So sometimes <laughs> you send me a message, you might be getting an answer a couple months, even a couple of years later. I apologize. That's just the way it is. So the question is, how do you deal with recovering from a more serious injury? I, the reader writes, had shoulder surgery and I'm out for six months. How do I keep the mental edge? How do I keep my sanity? Is there anything I can do to not lose my focus on BJJ and also not to lose everything that I've learned? What about a mindset when you finally do return and you're out of shape and behind? So, first of all, I'm sorry to hear this. Injuries suck, but ultimately they are part of the game. If you do this stuff for long enough, if you do anything for long enough, if you do badminton for long enough, you're going to have a layoff. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a little bit more physical little bit more likely that you are going to have layoffs. Hopefully your injuries are minor. Hopefully you don't require surgery like this reader did. And hopefully, you know, you not, don't have a six month layoff. But these things can happen. And you know what? <laughs> if you're uh, an adult and you end up having a kid, you're going to have a long layoff. If you go through a crazy work crunch, you're going to have a long layoff. The girlfriend makes a bad decision, wants to go to Mexico for a couple of weeks instead of you staying home and training. You're going to have a layoff. So you've got to learn to deal with layoffs even if you never, ever get injured. So you've had a layoff. Let's say it's a serious injury. What do you do? Really, your question is two-part. What do you do for the rehab? And then what do you do for the return to the mats? So let's start with the rehab first. The first and most important golden rule is you do not want to make it worse. Something like a rib injury is a great example. I don't know anybody who does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu who's had a rib injury and hasn't come back to the mat too early and re-injured that damn rib. Don't do that with a shoulder. Shoulder is way trickier than a rib. 
right? There's lots of little muscles there, lots of you know rotator cuff muscles. You don't want to rush back too fast. Let that damn thing heal. And even worse than coming back and irritating it is re-injuring it. Now they've got to go in there. They've already done surgery on it. Now they've got to go in there and work their way past the scar tissue and work with the little fragments of tissue I've left. Don't be that guy. Better to take an extra month or two, trust your doctors, and then come back and then actually have a shoulder that you can trust. So with that caveat, not to re-injure that body part, what else can you do? And I think physically cardio is the most important thing. You probably won't be able to do much weightlifting with a bum shoulder, but what you will be able to do is you'll be able to run, you'll be able to do the elliptical, you'll be able to climb hills, you'll be able to hike mountains. You've got to keep your cardio up. Your cardio is one of the very first things to go when you're injured and when, you're, when you've got a long layoff. So even if you're going on vacation to Mexico, bring your running shoes, keep the cardio up. Your jiu-jitsu will thank you for it when you get back. So find a way to keep that cardio up. Then additionally, if you can do any strength training whatsoever, that's a good thing. Depending on your injury, maybe you can work your legs. If your upper body's injured, work your lower body. If your lower body's injured, work your upper body. That helps, but strength fades slower than cardio. So you have a little bit more time to, uh, to have a layoff and not get all freaked out about, not, um, about losing all your conditioning. Now, during that rehab part, what do you do to keep your mind sharp? What do you do to keep your head in the game? Well, for a lot of people, what works is to watch either competition footage and or instructional footage, right? Maybe there's an area of your game that you've been hoping to research, like how do I pass spider guard? How do I, you know, um, attack from side mount? What are three great attacks from side mount? So let's say the, uh, or the 180 spin arm bar is your move. You could spend part of that six months researching how this person does his 180 spin arm bar, how that other person does his 180 spin arm bar. When has this been done in competition? You could just watch competition in general. Some people really absorb that as well. And if you can, even a little bit of light drilling, either you know, shadow wrestling by yourself or drilling with a sane, responsible, usually smaller partner is a really good way to just keep your movement going so that you're not completely uncoordinated when you get back. We, at least you're still moving a bit like a jiu-jitsu guy. Probably wouldn't recommend sparring, but you know there, there are certain kinds of drilling and movement drills that you can do, and those can be really useful. The point is to keep your head in the game, right? And watching video, watching instructionals, and, and doing a little bit of drilling really help with that. Now, when you come back to the mats, when you return to the mats, expect it to suck. This is a really discouraging time and nobody knows this better than I, because I've come back from a lot of injuries and other, you know, enforced layoffs. It really, really sucks when you're a black belt and you come back and there's a purple belt that you're 50 pounds heavier than and he's tapping you out. Believe me, this sucks. It's going to be ego crushing and that's just the way it is. You are strong enough to train, you're strong enough to get good, be strong enough to accept the mental ass whooping you're about to take on your ego when you know you can't beat people that you used to as a rough rule of thumb if, it, if you were laid up for six months if you took six months off it's going to take you six years <laughs> six years if you were laid off for six months it's going to take you six months to get back to where you were as a rough rule of thumb it depends uh, how early in your development you are if you've been training for two months it's not going to take you six months to get back to you, where you were two months but, you know, the longer the layoff, the longer the comeback period. During that comeback period, your number one priority is, you guessed it, don't get re-injured. This is not a time to test yourself against a big 250-pound ruffian, the competitive brown belt who's gunning for, uh, you know, a position at Abu Dhabi and thinks that every match is a death match. This is not the guy to roll with. The guys to roll with are usually the smaller guys, although there can be some very controlled bigger guys the guys who are not super aggro, the guys who are not explosive and spastic. You know, it's better to have some guy who methodically passes the guard and crushes you, but crushes you in slow motion, because you can tap out at any point if your shoulder begins to hurt, than it is the guy who like, Wah! throws himself past your guard, and you know, in the process catches your arm, rips that shoulder, undoes all that good work, and now you're back to square one. So do not get re-injured. Incidentally, when you come back to the mat, 
there'll be a couple of things that you'll find will typically be the problems. Number one, if you do a lot of grip work, if you do a lot of, say, spider guard or delahiva, and your, your game is really dependent on your grip, you'll find that your grip is just horrible. You know, your hands will be quivering like this after sparring for even a couple of minutes. This is normal. This will come back. Hopefully you're doing some kind of conditioning for your grip while you're off. But even so, it's not sport specific. It's just not used to that same rigors of hanging on to somebody's lapel or hanging on to somebody's sleeve. So your grip will probably be shot. For me, <laughs> the weird body parts, my adductors, the, the muscles that bring my legs together, always ache after a layoff and getting back to the mats. And I guess <laughs> you don't realize how much you use those legs to clamp people, to hold people, to squeeze people until, and, you, and this isn't a movement that you do, in regular life. So, you know, you start doing this all of a sudden and you go back to your old game, which relied on, say, clamping, all of a sudden muscles you never knew existed, muscles you took for granted are going to be hurting. And that's perfectly normal. Number, uh, number three is your cardio. Even if you've been running, even if you've been you know, doing sprint intervals on the, the bike or whatever, grappling is different. It might be because, you know, it's not as easy to get into a rhythmic breath. It's not so easy to go... And you're, you're, when you're grappling, you're going to hold your breath, and all of a sudden, you're going to gas. Again, this is normal. You know, and, and depending on what your game is like, you might be finding other limitations in your game when you finally get back to the mat. Just accept them. It took you a while to get good initially. You were gone for a while. It's going to take a while to get back to where you were. Don't worry. This is normal. Everybody goes through it. Everybody at the podium at the Mundials, everybody on the podium at Abu Dhabi, has had a layoff of some sort and has fought their way back. They did it, you can do it too. Next topic, the Z-Guard. I love playing the knee and half guard, or the Z-Guard, says this reader, so that I can attack the callers with loop chokes and collar chokes and hunt for Kimuras when my opponent defends the chokes. However, I have def trouble defending the pass or launching any attacks when my opponent stands up to pass. Any advice? or some simple ways to transition from half to open guard and launch some quick attacks? That's a really good question. Now, the Z guard, or the knee in guard, <laughs> a very effective counter to that is to stand up. If you can get rid of your opponent's grips and stand up, it completely nullifies that, that position. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go Google Z guard, go Google knee in half guard. You'll see exactly what I mean. Standing up pretty much nullifies that so your opponents are doing one of the correct passes. Too many people spend all their energy trying to fight their way through that knee that's in the way or trying to get it out of the way. Of course, the guy on the bottom is really good at defending that knee being pushed out of the way. And if that wasn't the case, people wouldn't use it. So it's, it's, it's refusing to play that game. It's saying, screw this. I'm going to stand up. Now I'm going to pass the guard on my feet. And that does nullify the Z guard. But that wasn't your question. Uh, your question was, what do you do if you're on the bottom? Fundamentally, I think a lot depends on the grips. From the bottom in the Z guard, you need grips. You need the sleeves, you need the knee, you need the lapel. With no gi, you need the head, you need the wrist, you need the underhook, you need the overhook. You need some way to hold them down. Otherwise, you're going to blow past your guard and end up in mount, end up in side mount, or even just stand up and disengage, which is, of course, what our friend is talking about. So the number one answer to stop them from just standing up is to get a good grip and keep their posture broken. So now, when you've got a grip, but maybe you weren't keeping their posture broken, or maybe they're really strong, or maybe they've managed to back up regardless, you've got a grip. Most open guard, well, <laughs> if you're standing and I'm down, then I'm typically going to be fighting you from the open guard, right? If I don't have any grips at all, now it's going to be that whole game of, you know, um, maybe sitting in butterfly guard, maybe sitting on my back and baiting you to come in so that I can grab one of those other guards. That's not really your question, I don't think, because everybody who plays uh, guard against somebody standing has to have some ways to make their initial grips, to get their initial contact, to entangle the person standing up. But if you've got some grips, if you've got a lapel grip and a sleeve grip, let's say, and the opponent stands up, that plays pretty well <laughs> into some classic types of guard. That plays well into De La Hiva, if you switch your grip and, uh, and insert that De La Hiva hook. That can, ins that can go well into reverse De La Hiva, into spider guard, 
into standard open guard where you've got, you know, say both feet on the hips and you've got a collar grip and a lapel grip, or a collar grip and a sleeve grip, excuse me, and you're pulling the guy forward. So take stock of what you already have. Hopefully you have a grip. If you have a grip, depending on which grip you have, it'll play into certain kinds of open guard uh, more easily. So what I suggest that you do with a training partner is, if, I don't know what kind of grip you normally use when you're on the bottom in Z guard. Hopefully you're using a grip. If you're not using a grip, start using a grip. It'll make standing up much more difficult. If you are using a grip, then get it with a partner, get that grip, let the guy stand up, and see what you can transition into. Like I said, the big ones, the most common ones, would be De La Hiva, Reverse De La Hiva, Spider, and Standard Open Guard. That's not an exhaustive list. If you're an upside down guard player, as the guy stands up, you spin upside down guard. You go to your, your bread and butter, you go to whatever you're comfortable with. But I think, I think the, the idea of using whatever grips you have to capitalize so that you don't have to completely release everything and then play that whole game of, okay, you're gonna try and run past my guard and I'm gonna try and catch something on the way in. If you don't release your grips, you're already a step ahead. Um, really, for a lot of open guard positions, it's getting the grip that's the hard part. And if you're going against a good open guard guy and he gets his grips, I wouldn't say you're completely screwed, but you're already, you know, you're not neutral anymore. You're already far, you know, far in deficit of where you need to be. Now you need to fight your way back to a neutral grip and then get your own grips before you get the round to passing. So if you can get a good grip right off the bat and avoid that whole detached and hunting for that initial grip phase, that's a really good thing. The next reader question is about cardio. And here's a question. My biggest flaw is cardio. I roll at a slow pace, but usually if it goes 10 minutes or more, I tend to then gas out very quickly. So, good question, important question. Cardio is king. Of the physical attributes of speed, of flexibility, endurance, uh, balance, base, all those things, I think that endurance, and in particular cardiovascular endurance, is the most important. And what I go to here is a story from Danny Nasanto, one of my martial arts instructors, a man I incredibly respect. And what he says is that, yes, you know, you're, you might be strong, you might be fast, you might have great balance, you might be smart, but if you're tired, if you don't have cardio, <laughs> then all of a sudden you're not smart, you're not strong, you're not fast, you don't have, you don't have anything. If you're tired, you lose all your other attributes. So the most important thing is endurance. And I completely agree. The, you know, there have been times when I've been stronger and not so strong. How much weight training, weight training am I doing? How much weight training am I not doing? How much cardio am I doing? How much cardio am I not doing? And inevitably in my game, the more cardio I do, the sharper my game is. So I'm biased. Some people have different forms of cardio. Some people like to do sprints and they find that sprints help them the most. And some people find long, slow distance or LSD training. Isn't that a great acronym? LSD uh, training helps them the most. That's the camp that I fall into. I've tried the sprints, doesn't work for me as much. But cardio is super duper important. But before we start ranting about cardio, there might be some easy fixes for you. There, well, simple fixes for you. First of all, are you overweight? If you're carrying a lot of extra weight, if you're, you know, more than 15, 20% body fat, if you've got a belly, you know, it's hard to give you advice about getting great cardio because quite honestly, you're carting around a whole lot of extra weight and that makes it hard to move. And sometimes you see, you know, bigger, fatter people with good cardio, but it's pretty rare. So that would be one, you know, really cleaning up your diet avoiding you know the sugars the the empty calories the beer i think that's a big one that nobody talks about um the alcohol those are really important this may not be what you want to hear but it's what i'm saying it's what i think is true so this is my podcast i can say whatever i want second thing do you smoke it's hard to believe that in this day and age there are still martial artists who smoke but you do run into them i personally love running in them on the mat because if you, you're rolling with somebody and you can smell, you know, smoke in their hair, smoke on their skin, almost always they're going to gas. All you need to do is roll with them for a bit. They're going to get tired. 
then you, you know, start putting pressure on their diaphragm with your body weight. You adjust your body weight so that you're putting more pressure on the diaphragm. Often you get the tap just from exhaustion, just because they can't breathe. So if you smoke, for the love of God, if you don't listen to anything else I ever tell you about jiu-jitsu or martial arts, stop. It's a filthy, horrible, destructive habit. There's no good side effects from it at all. It takes years and years off your life. And if this is the only lever I have, I'm going to use it. It'll make your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu much worse. So for the sake of getting your next belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, stop smoking now, never start again, if that's applicable to you. Another relatively easy thing to fix is breath holding. Some people, they've got good cardio, you know, if you put them on a treadmill, they can run for a long time, but you put them in a slightly stressful situation and it depends what it is. Some people do this in competition. Some people do this when they're fighting lower belts. Some people do this when they're fighting higher belts. They hold their breath. They're rolling and they're <laughs> and they're not breathing deeply all the time. You're using a lot of oxygen wrestling. It's tiring. There's, you know, there's a reason that people get tired. It's because it's tiring. If you're not breathing continuously and paying attention to, even though you're in a difficult position, even though you're in a scramble, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. That will often prematurely make you tired. I'm not going to say too much more about that. If you're interested in that topic, go look on grapplearts.com. Go look for an article called Breathing, Oxygen, and Exhaustion. And that's a story of somebody who had pretty good cardio, but would get tired when they were wrestling, I believe, people not as good as they were. <laughs> and it was because when they were wrestling somebody really good, they were like, oh man, I'm going to lose anyway. So they could relax and they would lose, but they wouldn't get exhausted. When they were wrestling against somebody who they thought they had to beat, they would hold their breath unconsciously. And in that article, Breathing Oxygen Exhaustion, is the solution for what this guy did to fix this problem and then do really well in competition afterward. So it is fixable. So now, if you're not overweight, if you don't smoke, if you don't hold your breath, why are you getting tired? Well, really, the answer then is your cardio sucks. Maybe it's as simple as you only train once or twice a week. If you only train once or twice a week, that's not enough of an exercise stimulus to get a huge boost in your rolling cardio. So then you get a choice. Well, you get three choices. Put up with it just the way it is. Two, train more often. Three, do additional cardio. Or if, if you do train two or three times a week, you might want to start doing additional cardio. I'm a big believer in this. I really think it's helped me and my game. There's a reason that almost all fighters do some kind of cardio. There are some people who can get away with just sparring. I'm typically not one of those people. I find that if I'm just doing a ton of sparring, it beats my body down too much, quite honestly. Especially hard enough sparring to get that <sighs> heavy breathing going, which is the part that stimulates you to develop better cardio. At this time in my life, I am training, but I am trying to do one one-hour cardio session a week that's really hard. That's typically climbing a mountain. And then I'll do another you know, 20, 25 minute easier jog at another time of the week. So I'm doing my training, doing my weightlifting, and then I'm still doing a couple of cardio sessions a week. And I find that that really helps. It just, you know, it puts gas in your gas tank. So if you're going with somebody, you can say, yeah, I'm going to go hard and you're going to fight hard and your gas tank's going to get drawn down and my gas tank's going to get drawn down. But my gas tank's going to be a bit, it's always going to be a little bit higher than yours because it was higher to start with. And that's a really reassuring uh, situation. If you're just brand new to cardio, don't injure yourself. Do something like a walk run program you know where you walk for a minute jog for a minute walk for a minute jog for a minute you know don't go all crazy slowly increase your distances go a little bit longer every week you know don't uh, go out there and try and run a marathon right away you'll get there it'll take a little while and uh, thus endeth my rant on cardio next topic passing the guard reader writes my biggest problem right now is getting past the guard. Let me preface that with the fact that I've only been training two months, that I'm having a blast. My kid wrestled in high school and I could never keep him off of me until the other day. What a nice feeling. I've been out of shape for a few years and I'm just trying to figure out if I'm moving fast enough in the guard. Well, congratulations. You know, the, you are making progress. You measured it with your kid. 
and typically around the two month mark is where things really begin to fall into place for people. So the first couple months of jujitsu are just a blur. You really don't have an idea of what's going on. And you know, the fact that you stuck it out this far during what can be a very discouraging period is fantastic. So like I said, congratulations. And it does sound like you're making progress. So in a certain sense, my answer is going to be keep doing what you're doing. Don't change. But I can offer you a few little additional suggestions. I think the number one mistake made by beginners is not getting a grip. Yes, you can fight somebody with no grip, you know, if, especially if they're standing and you're sitting or, or lying on your back and just trying to use speed. But if they are experienced and fast and athletic and are trying to blow past your guard, then yes, you do need to move faster. Uh, if you're holding them in butterfly guard, and this would be a dumb thing, but butterfly guard with both hands behind your back and they try and pass, you're going to have to move incredibly fast to avoid that pass or be super dexterous. The thing that beginners do often is they don't get their grips. By getting a grip, by getting a collar grip, a knee grip, a sleeve grip, an overhook, an underhook, controlling the head, you know, grabbing the leg, something is they slow down the game. You're changing it from like a speed-based athleticism blast past your guard game to a, a question of, of, of tactics and strategies and, okay, here's the grip. Do you know the counter to that grip? And do I know the counter to the counter of that grip? And as you're stripping that grip, I'm going to get another one. I'm going to control, going to move from controlling your sleeve to controlling your head and, and attacking. So if this is you, if you're trying to do jujitsu and keep the guy on your guard without any grips, that's part of your answer. Start getting grips. Grab some, really grab something, anything. If the guy steps forward, grab his heel. If the guy reaches for you, grab his sleeve, grab his wrist. If the guy bends forward, grab his lapel. Grab something and it'll slow it down. Now, if you're doing that already, that you are getting your grips, my answer is going to be a little bit more waffly. Because really, if I've got guard pass technique number one, you will have guard pass technique number one, counter number one, counter number two, counter number three. You know, there, there might be anywhere from one to five common counters to any guard pass that you can think of. You know, the knee cut, there are a whole bunch of counters. The uh, Toriando, there are a whole bunch of counters. A smash pass, there are a whole bunch of counters. So really, there are a whole bunch of techniques that you need to learn. Which one to learn? Well, really just pick one of them. You know, what did my guard get passed with most last class? Uh, it was somebody taking the legs and tossing them to the side and passing. All right, you go to your instructor or you go online and you do like leg toss pass counters. You do a search for that. Maybe you find an answer online, maybe you don't. You ask your instructor, hopefully he has an answer, maybe he doesn't. Go ask your fellow students, try and figure it out yourself. For now, you're, counter, you're concentrating on leg toss pass counters. What can I do to make this harder for the, for the opponent to do to me? And then drill that a little bit, and then even try and incorporate in your sparring. Hey, hey Jim, would it be okay if we started standing, if he always does you know, the leg toss pass from standing, and uh, can you just try and pass my guard with this one pass? You know, they'll probably say yes, and then you can isolate it. And then, you, okay, you finally figure that out, and then you go to another uh, guard pass. All right, every time they're, uh, they're passing my guard, they're doing the, the knee cut. All right, go find some knee cut counters, pick one of them that looks like it would work for you, and try it out. So, if it's not something real simple, like you're not getting grips, then the answer is one by one, you're going to have to accumulate all the counters or enough counters so that you have a, a workable counter to every major type of guard pass. And I hope that helps. Um, it's also something that will come with time. Don't worry. Keep at it. You're doing great. And uh, you'll have your answers soon enough. All right. Final question is about drilling. And this comes from a reader. Everyone says drilling is important, but there are so many different techniques to drill. How do I know which technique or techniques to drill? Good question. And it's a common area of confusion because I get asked this question a lot. I'm glad that I can offer some insights on it anyway. There are really two answers. If you're a beginner, if you're intermediate, advanced. So for a beginner, what do you drill? That answer is really easy. 
you drill the basics. What are the basics? Well, funny you should ask. In my uh, book, A Roadmap for BJJ, I talk about the six basic positions, and which you can expand into eight positions if you break up the guard into close guard, open guard, half guard. So there are eight basic positions. For each of these eight basic positions, you have submissions you can do, escapes to get out of it if you're in, a, in the bad side of that position, and transitions you can use to get to a better position. An example with this, of this would be, you know, from knee mount, you can go to full mount. That would be improving your position. Uh, from guard, you can sweep the guy and go to side mount. That would be improving your position. From guard, you can pass the guard. That would be escaping the position. So those are three options for every position. How many positions do we say? They're basically eight. So for those eight positions, you need at least one of each of those techniques, so each of those three techniques. So that's 24 techniques. For the mount, you need escapes from the mount, submissions from the mount, and ways to transition from mount to other positions, the back set. For side mount, you need attacks from side mount, submission from side mount. You need ways to improve the position if you're on top. You need ways to get out of the position on bottom. So the basics are the most fundamental answers for each of those. For from Close guard, your basic submission might be the arm bar. From close guard, your basic sweep, there are many basic sweeps, you're just gonna pick one for now that seems to fit your body. Maybe the scissor sweep, maybe the hip box sweep, maybe the flower sweep. What it is, is kind of irrelevant. And to some extent, if your instructor is trying to teach you a basic escape from side mount or a basic sweep from close guard, that's the one you should be drilling. The basics. If you're not a beginner, you're intermediate advanced, and I would roughly say blue belt here, but really more what I'm talking about is people who are beginning to put together a game plan. So by the time you're putting together a game plan, your emphasis on drilling will probably change. Yeah, it's good to review the basics, 100%. Do you need to drill them as much as you did initially? Probably not. You probably repeat it a couple of times, you're like, oh yeah, that's exactly how it goes. So then what should you spend most of your drilling time on? I think two things, game plan development and problem solving specific areas. Game plan development, what's a game plan? A game plan is a set of techniques that fit well together. Here's what's not a game plan. Uh, hip buck sweep from closed guard, X guard stand up sweep, barambolo from De La Hiva, and um, arm drag from butterfly. Those are like random disparate techniques. They don't tie together. If you're um, arm drag from butterfly didn't work. It's not like you can go into your barambolo from De La Hiva right away. They don't fit together that smoothly. A game plan is a set of techniques starting right, perhaps starting on your back, where you sweep an opponent and you try and attack. And if he counters, you have an answer for counter number one. You have an answer for counter number two. You have an answer for counter number three. And you find a way to take them down. And then the game plan continues because depending where you end up in that sweep, you're going to have different ways to pass the guard, right? There'll be certain guard passes or certain adjustments you'll need to make so that you can go seamlessly from the sweep into the guard pass into the submission. And all high-level players have got a game plan. Some of them are more complicated than others. And if you're intermediate to advanced, you kind of want to be building a bunch of techniques that work really well together. So an example might be you've got a killer butterfly guard sweep. Just awesome. But the guy sometimes posts his leg. Well, your game plan development there might be drilling your butterfly guard sweep, then drilling your butterfly guard sweep, the guy posts his legs, going to X guard and sweeping the guy from X guard. That's beginning to put together a game plan. Then from X guard, you end up on top, saying going double unders and passing the guard either to the left or to the right. Those are all techniques that hook together really smoothly and you'll find yourself doing them in sparring in exactly the way that you drill them. It's really cool when that happens. Like, holy, you know, holy, I, I, I drilled this exact sequence yesterday and it's coming out exactly the way I drilled it in sparring. That's a very, very cool feeling. The other thing you're gonna work on drilling as a intermediate to advanced player is problem solving. Maybe there's a certain type of guard that you're having difficulty passing. You just cannot figure out how to pass this one guy's De La Hiva guard. Because when you try and backstep, he does X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter what it is. So you might drill with him or you might drill with somebody else and specifically look, you know, try and figure out what an answer to this problem might be 
and then repeat your physical solution again and again and again. So you're just patching a hole in your position. Another example might be you keep on getting caught in this one arm bar. Well, it's time to work your arm bar defenses. In particular, your arm bar defenses to that kind of attack. Maybe um, you've got a throw that just isn't working um, because a, a specific opponent is doing a specific thing. Well, you're going to drill the solution to that. So you're going to spend most of your time doing game plan development and then a little bit of patching the holes. You know, Game plan development is essentially building off of your strengths. You've got your strengths, you're trying to find new strengths and trying to make what you do well even stronger. The other kind of sort of hole patching part of the game is trying to fix up your weaknesses. So those are more situational. Um, it's, uh, you're, you'll, you'll know what you need to work on. Uh, here, what were the last three submissions you got caught in? There's an example of what to work on. What is the one sweep that your main training partner always catches you in? That's another thing that you can work on. What is a position where you get completely stuck and you just have no idea what to do next? Well, if you take that apart, you dissect it, you analyze it, you do your research, you'll probably find a solution, especially if you take it out of the context of, you know, we're in the middle of a hardcore role and it's life or death and you can't actually think. If you take that and go back to a calm, sedate training partner, you say, I always get caught in this position. Let's just do, I wonder what happens if I push my foot. Oh, that's not good. I wonder what happens if I take my hand and put it there. Hmm, that seems to improve it. I wonder what happens if you change the grip from here to here. You know, you're, you're breaking it apart and then you find a solution. You find a way to get out of that position and then you repeat it. That's also drilling. So it's a long winded answer, but the concept of drilling is a really uh, interesting one. People mean so many different things by drilling as well. There's solo drilling, there's partner drilling, there's cycle drilling, there's uh, competitive drilling, there's semi-competitive drilling, there's constrained drilling. It's a really big topic. I hope I gave you some of the answers that you needed. I hope that this has been useful to the other people listening. And, you know, I thank everybody for all the questions they send in. I do try and read all my stuff. It's just really difficult to get back to everybody in a timely manner sometimes. So I hope you understand. Good luck with your training, and I'll catch you on the next podcast.